Living Country in the City, Episode 2. Y'all ready for your dose of flyover state spirit? Straight from the concrete jungle? Well, put down your latte and pull on your boots. It's time for Living Country in the City. Hey, y'all, thank you so much for joining me for my second episode of Living Country in the City. You know, I'm super excited to be doing this podcast today because joining us is a coworker of mine, Samson. <laughs> uh, just Samson. He is an experienced hunter, a uh, fisher, an outdoorsman, and he's really been a mentor of mine as I learn more and more about backcountry and big game hunting. He's really pointed me in some good directions and given me some solid advice. So I think we're going to get into some great stuff. Samson, thank you so much for joining me. No, no problem. Uh, so I guess to start, why don't you uh, tell me a little bit about your history with hunting, how you got started, and kind of a uh, quick version of what what your experience is. Uh, well, let's see. Um, I grew up in Texas as a kid, and uh, my first uh, experience with hunting was probably at the age of uh, six years old when I snuck out a 30 odd six out of the closet while my parents were away and uh propped it up on a bob wire fence and uh shot a cow uh not a cow elk but a beef cow and uh scoped myself pretty good i got a pretty good shiner freaked out because i was uh not expecting the recoil and uh you know ran back in hid the gun uh was totally busted when i you know parents got home and uh I had a ring around my eye that everybody in the house knew exactly what it was and went and grabbed the gun and saw that, you know, a, a round had been chambered and shot. So, um, now was this your, your family's cow or was this like a neighbor's? Oh, uh, this is a neighbor. This Ooh. is uh, the neighbor in the back, which, um, it was, a like a co-op type Indian reservation where, you know, you're 30 miles from the closest store. So you, uh, you trade, you know, we had rabbits, chickens, a garden. The, you know, we trade beef. The guy that lives behind us, you know, and people across the road were given eggs to for whatever. It's a barter system. So, uh, you know, the next day, of course, I uh, I get walked over to the to the farmer and uh, have to uh, explain what I did, being the age I was and kind of freaked out. I was completely terrified, and having cousins at the time that were. You know, all they did was hunt and fish. They probably only, you know, showed up to school probably two days a week because they were always out in the fields. Uh, you know, they're just torturing me. Like, farmer's going to make you do this. <laughs> farmer's going to make you do that. He's going to make you eat the whole thing. You're going to have to pay for it. You're going to have to mow lawns. It's a whole thing. And I'm a little, little kid. And I get over there and, you know, uh, is from what I don't remember much of it, but you know, I hear a lot of stories from family members and they still to this day tease me about it. And, uh, you know, I, uh, basically got taught how to, uh, tear apart and, you know, butcher my first animal because that was part of my punishment was to help him take this cow apart and, uh, in the field, at least half of it. And, uh, don't really remember too much, but I guess I threw up a few times and, um, kind of hated the whole thing and kind of got a little into it towards the end so uh <laughs> so i basically got to you know take apart my first cow even though it wasn't an elk um but my first beef cow that i shot myself and killed and uh you know didn't really realize till afterwards that you know i took this thing out with one shot from probably a pretty good distance because i remember it was pretty far away that's the only thing i do kind of remember and uh you know resting the the gun on my shoulder because it was too heavy to pick up and uh, putting my eye right up against the scope and pulling the trigger was, uh, even my cousins thought that was pretty funny. So that's, uh, it started from that, and then it just, it went from, I didn't shoot another animal with a rifle until I was probably 18, 19. Um, prior to me pulling the trigger on the, the beef cow, I, uh, you know, I had probably killed, you know, three chickens and a rabbit with a bow. In, around the yard, you know, okay. just kind of um, a, a handmade bow that somebody had made that got passed down to me. Then I went to a fiberglass recurve uh, with uh, wooden dowels that were with feathers stuck on them any way possible or tied on, and no broad he head or practice tip. It was literally, you know, it, when it got dull, you sharpened it again with a knife kind of thing. So, um, and uh, I was pretty proficient with it. I uh, 
I would shoot gar because we lived on a lake. Um, by the time I was like, you know, seven or eight, I was moving back and forth from California and back to Texas, back and forth. So I spent my summers either in Texas um, or my aunt in Sedona, you know, Arizona and uh, parts of New Mexico. And every time, you know, every opportunity was hunting and fishing. And um, I had an uncle that lived in Georgia when I was a kid, and I spent the summers there. And it was all about, you know, bear hunting and, and deer hunting. So um, I kind of got thrown into it. And my mom, probably more than anybody else, my mom pretty much raised me. My dad died when I was uh, not even one yet. And uh, my mom pretty much raised, you know, she was my mom and my dad for for the most part. But she was uh, she was all about fishing. And she wasn't a huge hunter, but she could pull the trigger on an animal. And uh, she pushed me to, you know, always in the right direction on certain people to to learn how to, you know, take care of your hunt and take care, you know, take care of your whatever you shot and killed and everything else. And I was always, you know, just the reservation was you don't kill anything unless you're going to eat it. So I've, uh, I've eaten some really weird stuff that I probably shouldn't have, but the rule was if you <laughs> killed it, you ate it. So, you know, you know, seven years old, I've probably, you know, I ate a couple gophers and uh, a turtle, you know, a few things that I killed and the rule, that was a rule. So that's what I did. So, so what, what, what would you say the, uh, the most bizarre, bizarre thing you've, you've eaten because of hunting uh well yeah see bizarre to me does is probably not so bizarre to other people i mean by the time i was in elementary school i probably had eight more snakes than i could count you know just because that's what i that, that was one of those things that i'd love to catch and love to eat and uh you know rabbits were something we ate at the dinner table rabbits we raised but going out and catching one how whether it was a snare or shooting it, or I got a few with a slingshot when I was little, and I was pretty proficient with. And uh, I, uh, you know, probably, probably armadillo or something like that, because interesting, okay, um, wasn't really me that killed it. At the very end, I had a dog that got a hold of armadillos underneath the house and put a couple holes in it. You know, pretty pretty good where it wasn't gonna make it and. I got the bright idea, like, well, let's tear this thing apart and see what it tastes like. So, um, <laughs> seems like that, that one would be a lot of work to. That one's a little, a little, little weird and probably not too bad. And then, you know, after the fact of going places and, you know, traveling to different places and eating like raccoon and possum, stuff like that, very similar as far as I was concerned. You know, it was like, well, I've had this before. So, really, it really wasn't that weird. And I'm kind of one of those people, I'll eat anything at least twice. So, yeah. so how would you describe your. I guess hunting experience now. Like, uh, what's well, your I, uh, trips? I'm. I, I guess you would say I'm like a a returning hunter. I took some time off. Um, you know, just career wise, I I've toured and you know the music festivals and everything else that you know that I'm involved with. Um, you know, hunting took a back seat. Fishing kind of took over a little bit because it was easier and I could get out on the water and. I'm more of a, you know, I did the bass tournaments. I did, you know, the uh, fly fishing to the point where I was, you know, teaching how to, you know, cast. Um, anything fishing kind of, I was just engulfed in it. And saltwater fishing was my passion, you know, from the Mako tournaments to, you know, tuna tournaments and going out tuna fishing for multi-day trips out in the ocean. That's what, that was my passion. And getting in a hunt here and there, like a duck hunt, you know, once in a while. But, you know, Southern California... It, uh, very limited and being able to not really get away and not travel as much because of family or work. Um, I just, I kind of filled my, my needs with, you know, local saltwater fishing, you know, Southern California kind of have that, you know, that advantage of driving down San Diego, going on a multi-day boat and have that chance that, you know, a couple tuna here and there or, or, or a handful of exotics, you know, Wahoos, Dorado, or whatever it is. And, uh, it, uh, I'm in a position now where I have, you know, I, I don't exactly have a lot more free time, but I do have a little more control over what, you know, my work schedule. So I can take off some stuff unless we have a festival in October that messes up my hunt like I did this year. But uh, I do have, uh, I got the bug again. Um, you know, I, you know, it's probably been, it was like, you know, I was probably going on six years without, you know, really going on a real true hunt, you know, and then six years ago, 
I was I was putting in, you know, for every state. I was putting in for Arizona, Utah. I was either buying points or I was like trying to, you know, put every hunt landowner tags trying to f- track them down. I mean, it was uh I I was just trying to get in as much as possible in that short season and I'm right back in there. I mean, I literally I I can't you know, when I come to work and I work and then, you know, I'm on my breaks or I heading home, I'm listening to a hunting podcast or um, when I get home, it's a couple hours of going on go hunt and I'm, you know, researching units. And I literally just follow the the schedules of, you know, what's the next draw? You know, I put in for Utah. I did points only because I knew that um, if I drew Utah, it would kind of mess up the rest of my, my hunts this year. I put in for, you know, Wyoming. Um I'm putting in for Idaho. I put in, you know, um, I'm probably going to do some Arizona stuff if possible. And, you know, backup plans are um, Idaho over the counters if nothing pans out. So it's it's kind of what everybody's playing. You know, this this is the exciting type of this time of the season where everybody's, you know, they're just literally like researching units and calling people and, and talking to biologists and everybody else. And then, you know, buddies like, hey, what about this unit or finding people that have hunted past units. So it's just a lot of research. And uh, it's amazing how it just kind of comes right back. Like there's things I know about units that were, you know, six, seven years ago that is still true now. And some people don't even know. And uh, because it was before it was back when we used to do the research the old way. You know, you went you went to every single website and got as much information as you could but there was no there was no go hunt there was no you know hunting fool like there wasn't you know the stuff that i utilize now you had to literally get that stuff and there wasn't a google earth like the way there is now and google earth is i live and die by that it's uh it's like scouting without being there you know you don't get the exercise but you know you you can really plan out a lot of your stuff and then um you know come back analyze it go out scouting come back and see if it was true and you know eliminate areas and be able to really dial in your you know hunting areas so that brings up kind of an interesting topic i mean you know the name of the podcast is living country in the city Mm -hmm. and so really the whole idea is you know there's a lot of people like us uh in places like los angeles new york san francisco these Mm -hmm. big cities where it's not only is it is it just not as common, but a lot of times it's either outright hostile or just very difficult to do stuff like this. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned, you know, you use Google Earth. I mean, I know a lot of hunters, even those that live out in the country, do that. Um, what uh, what else would you say are the some of the difficulties of living in the middle of the city yet? loving these loving these things that are uh, not so typically associated with someone that would live in like Orange County or Los Angeles and and also I guess on the inverse what benefits do you see possibly uh as well uh you, you would think that you know if you're sitting anywhere else if you're in one of the hunting meccas you're thinking oh man southern california you know run into people at you know shows all the time they're like oh my god you're from california isn't camo illegal there (laughs) you know i wear camo to work just to see what i get responses from people all the time you know because they just it's just we we work in downtown la and uh but i think that some of the biggest i think the biggest challenges is um it's not exactly access because there's a ton of public land i mean you've gone on those hikes where you know you can go out there and never see anybody but then during hunting season and you go to, you know, if, even if you drove down to San Diego where, you know, there's, you have a chance at the smallest deer known to man, but, you know, you, at least you have a chance at it. You have the, you know, pumpkin army chasing you around as well. You know, it just literally, even in, during the bow season, you know, you, they, they have valet at the trailhead, you know, it might as well, it, it's, it's just um, a lot more hunters than anybody can think of. Like most people think that, oh, people in California don't hunt. People in Southern California don't hunt. There's a lot of deer and stuff like that in Northern California. There's actually a lot of people. It's just, uh, it's, it's, there's a lot more people than there is animals to hunt. You know, you can't hunt mountain lions at all, period. You can't hunt bears with dogs. So like, you know, 
the, there's barely any deer because you know the cat all the cats bobcats mountain lions um the bears like the the fawns almost don't even exist so you just don't have the populations that are you know potential there's great places there's places that used to hold tons of deer back in the day i remember my first deer in california you know him at california i was in a river bottom and you know probably seen you know 160 inch mule deers you know it's not it's not the 200 that everybody's shooting for but you know back then being a you know being younger and um you know just being able to almost go in your backyard drive an hour or two and get somewhere and actually hunt and actually have potential to take a you know a decent animal um that that's not there and it ha- that has somewhat to do with the pressure but it it does it's it's just there is uh there's way too many predators on top of even the human predators out here that make it just way too difficult and, and with california it's just it's difficult to you know we can't do anything about it like yeah you can go hunt bears but good luck you know you can't bait them you can't can't run a dog and uh it makes it very very difficult i uh I had two deer tags, a bobcat tag, and a bear tag this year, and I didn't fill any of them. I mean, half of it's because of schedule. The deer tag's just uh, a show got in the way. Um, but the bear tag and the bobcat tag, it just I probably could have went out in my backyard because I have bobcats running around all the time. But um, I just didn't have time. But it's also, you know, everybody I know that had a bear tag this year, every single person that I know, and it's a pretty good handful of people that got a bear tag because everybody buys a bear tag when they buy a, a deer, you know, tag and go somewhere. So a lot of the guys got deer, not one bear, you know, and we know that they're there. You know, you find kills all the time. You go hiking, you find a kill, and it's either the, the bobcat that, you know, killed it or the bear that killed it, and then the coyotes come in and steal it from them. So now the bear and the bobcat and the or the, you know, mountain lion have to go kill another one, you know. They probably wouldn't kill so many if you didn't have so many damn coyotes. And that's the other thing is, you know, you go out and coyote, coyote hunt or predator hunt in California and people look at you funny, you know. They just don't under And it's more of an education thing. They just don't understand. They think, you know, oh, you know, save Bambi, but don't shoot the coyote either. And I was like, you know what, realistically, I'm protecting Bambi from the coyote. And, well, I was going to say until it uh, starts eating the cat that's walking on their even, back fence. Even you then, know? you know, even then, there's – even with – you know, even in my neighborhood, I live in, you know, I, I'm in Orange County, and in the last year, half the animals, pets, in my neighborhood are gone because of coyotes. You know, they, every time I walk, you know, if I could drive home late, and it's a suburban, but surrounded by mountains kind of area, and uh, every night when I come home late, there's something. Like, there's either cats in somebody's yard meaning like their mountain lions are right out in the open um there's bobcats everywhere and uh coyotes are just they just run rampant you know there used to be rabbits there used to be you know everybody had a pet and a dog and now it's just if you don't have a dog that's has a fighting chance against one of these animals it just disappears you know people don't let their you know it's uh and getting anybody to understand that is it's an it's almost not even worth the argument half the time you know you just kind of they don't get it we don't get it so you know i I would love to hunt in california more but i'm almost to the point now where you know i'll take opportunities here um but i don't mind driving and you know i still put in for all these other states i'll drive you know drive to montana drive to idaho do all these other hunts and then find opportunities here, you know, if need be. They're still here. There's still hog hunts. There's still, you can drive up, you know, not too far and do a turkey hunt. There is deer, you know, that you just got to get to them. And a lot of places, you know, the, the deer know where to, where they can be. They'll go into areas where you just can't shoot a projectile. Like in my neighborhood and even the hills behind me, um, you know, you can't even shoot a, a, a slingshot. You know, it's a zero, they base it on, it's a zero projectile you know, area. I couldn't even go out there and try to kill something with a slingshot if I wanted to. So I I probably couldn't throw a rock at something without getting in trouble. So um, it's just very difficult. There's a lot of rules that are in place and there's a lot of people that vote not thinking the whole thing through. And, you know, they, they think they're doing the right thing and I get that, but they just don't understand that, you know, you have to keep certain animals in check so other animals can thrive. And it's one of those weird things that people ask and I get it 
all the time, especially working in downtown LA, that uh, how how can you be a conservationist and want to kill animals? You know, they they ask us. They don't understand the part where you know I give all this money to Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, then Mule Deer Foundation. You know, I'm part of all these or- BHA. I'm part of all these organizations, and I've fully, fully like you know the. the the public land issue is one part, but they also fight for, you know, getting land back and not, you know, and, and you know, introducing animals into certain areas. And, you know, there's there's more elk than there's ever been, you know, since, you know, Lewis and Clark, you know, there's because of conservation. You know, that's the whole thing. And it's like, yeah, I want elk here. Yeah, I want to harvest them and eat them. And, um, but, you know, I want them to be here for a long time. And it's one of those, it is a weird thing. It's like one of those things where you're like, you pull back on, on an elk and you're looking right at it and he's looking right at you and you let go and you're thinking, wow, like this is the most amazing animal. Um, and even when you walk up on something and it's only something you can explain to think of like a horse laying down and you walk up on it and you, you know, touch it. That's how big, you know, a good size elk is. But you you start thinking like, you know, I, I have a passion for an animal that I've chased and I love so much and then I want to kill it. Yeah. I, I, I can totally understand how like, you know, anti hunters or non hunters can understand that or, or not understand what we do, but it's uh it's one of those things where you know we come from you know we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for honey you know we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you know when when settlers came across i mean i i'm i'm half native american you know i get the hunting side but i'm also you know half german that were on plymouth rock you know they they came over and and migrated all the way to wherever they ended up in arkansas or wherever it is um but you know they didn't bring groceries. You know, they had to hunt. They had to, you know, no one went to the store. And that's the thing is you'll have people eating a cheeseburger looking at you like, how could you be a hunter? It's like, you know what? At least I know where my, you know, meat came from. And you guys talk about all this, like, you know, pure grass-fed, you know, nothing's more grass-fed than elk that's running up and down, you know, the hills eating all day. He had a, a amazing life. And, yeah, I went up there and hunted and harvested him, but I'm not going to waste the meat. I'm going to eat the whole thing. And it's not like a cow that sat in its own slop and, you know, somebody put a piston through his head and then they chopped him up and put him in the supermarket. You know, uh, and usually when I explain that to them, nine out of ten get it. I get a lot of the hikers who say, well, can't you just admire them? And and I'm, it's just there's something so different about it. You're, I mean, an active participant versus this passive observer you get mm-hmm. this connection that is just it's so far beyond just being that passive observer and and you gain a respect i mean when you're uh spot and stock when you are literally learning every behavior you know it's you know where they sleep where they eat you know how they'll behave when the weather turns this way or when it turns this way how they react to hunting pressure how and and you invest so much time it so often in one single animal Mm -hmm. not even just this whole group but just this one animal you'll spend days chasing after it Mm -hmm. and how can you not feel that connection i mean that is something you will never ever get Mm -hmm. just yeah and 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 i you know i can understand the there's there's a you know they call them granolas or whatever you know whatever the name you have for somebody that doesn't hunt and 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 you know i have tons of people that i shop at rei a lot and i go in and i'll you know people think that i'm crazy i have buddies that i've grown up with and they're like i can't believe you wore camo into a sika jacket into into rei they probably murdered you and i was like no not really like in reality there's i mean you can go into certain reis that are they're, they're all hunters that, you know, they'll actually hit you up like, Hey, did you take anything this uh, year? Do you got any extra meat? Hmm. You know? And then the ones that I almost, I almost like the challenge of the full blown anti, why, why are you doing this? Like I, I almost want, I don't even argue with them. I just hear them out and listen to them. And it's, it's just interesting how even they're not always on the same page with each other. You know, they all have a different ID, you know, ideal of, of why it's wrong, but this anti versus this anti versus this anti, like you might run into, you know, three or four in in different areas and they all think it's wrong for a different reason versus, you know, 
most hunters, they, they all hunt for the same reason. You know, there's not a lot, you know, there's, they, yeah, there's people that trophy hunt. Like the, the, that's even something that gets skewed. Anti hunters think trophy hunters, like we go out, we shoot the deer, we chop its head off, leave the body and we just hang the head on our wall. You know, there's, there's probably people in the past that have ruined that, you know, for us because they, they went out and the, yeah, they hunted a lion and they just brought back the head and they throw it on there. But that's not like that anymore. You know, even if you were to go out and hunt an elephant, like people want that elephant, you know, it's thrashing the the village. And when you, when you do take it down, like I've never done it before, but you know, like Jim Burnsworth, you know, he's gone out and he's taken out an elephant and fed a whole village, you know, and they're just like so thankful that that elephant's not around anymore. And it's like, you know, you have to cull herds. If you have too many animals, you get sickness, you get, you know, over, over, any type of overpopulation that's not controlled. You know, it just, if you're just like, oh, let's sit back and well, let's watch them. Basically, let's watch them turn into a disease that has to kill off themselves and maybe other things. But if you keep it in check, they, they're healthy. They, you know, you don't have those issues anymore. And then, you know, when you, sometimes when you run into the, these people that they just, I think that they just don't understand and they've only heard other people that, oh, that's, you know, they're a bunch of hunters well, and they don't know, understand it. But once you explain it to them, a lot of times they get it. They really do. In in any group, I you know, I, I try and explain to people, I'm like, in any group, you're going to get these people that that are selfish and mm-hmm. and only thinking of one thing, not considering the uh, the full gamut of issues that they can be causing you, you know you're going to get these bad apples yeah and uh, one thing i love about these groups of ethical hunters though is as opposed to other groups ethical hunters will be the first ones to shut that down mm-hmm. they will they will be the first ones to call that out you know we don't make excuses for these these you know i hate using the term but bad apples yep um versus a lot of other groups you know you'll i mean not anything in particular but you know they'll they'll have these few bad apples and they'll be like oh well but they have good intentions Mm -hmm. and you know i don't know hunters are like heck no if you do this suddenly now i can't i can't hunt bear uh i can't bait bear in california anymore and you know, you're you're taking this away from all of us. Mm-hmm. You're causing all kinds of issues just because you want to you want to do this. I mean, that's that's one thing I love about these groups of ethical hunters is they will be the first ones to call these people out yeah. and really shut them down. Um, really quick on that note, uh, I want to take a minute and uh, hear this word from our sponsor. Hey, y'all, if you're like me, a new elk hunter really trying to up your game and get into backcountry big game hunting, or if you're an experienced hunter trying to fill tags more consistently, you really need to check out elk101.com's University of Elk Hunting online course. If you're looking for a central resource to really take you all the way from start to finish when it comes to big game hunting, this is it. Corey Jacobson is a world champion elk caller and one of the definitive experts when it comes to elk hunting. And in this online course, he shares over 30 years of his elk hunting experience, strategies, and tips. All of this is broken down into easy to digest modules and packed full of great video content as well. This will provide you with all of the resources you need to be a confident elk hunter, regardless of your past experience. What's even better is you can get $20 off the University of Elk Hunting online course by visiting livingcountryinthecity.com slash partners. That's livingcountryinthecity.com slash partners. Okay. Um, so we talked about some of the kind of negatives of, of living in the city. Do you see any any positives to living in an environment like this and – being a hunter, being a fisherman, um, doing these things, once again, not normally so associated with living in Los Angeles, Orange County, Southern California. Well, I mean, where we are, no matter where you I mean, just Southern California as a whole. I mean, where else can you, I mean, we always have this joke and we've had it as, you know, growing up and when I've came to California and pretty much moved here permanently, a lot of cousins and a lot of people, half um, never hunted and fished in their whole life. And the other half kind of came from where I came from. So they kind of understood that. But, uh, you know, we always have this running joke of where can you where where else in, in the world can you, you know, 
go go skiing in the morning and, and surfing in the evening, it's the same thing as like you could literally go to the beach and go saltwater, you know, fishing, go you know, deep sea fishing or whatever you want to call it, offshore fishing, um, in the morning and then make it to the hills, you know, during hunting season and have the potential of taking a, a, a yellowtail, a tuna, a barracuda, whatever it is and, and, and a deer in the same day. You know, where we are, it doesn't take too far, no matter which direction we go. It doesn't it takes a couple hours to get to San Diego. You know, there's some hawk hunts, and there's pretty good deer hunting, you know, fairly good deer hunting down there during the season. Um, talk, there's turkey. There's, you know, all kinds of waterfowl. And then you can drive north about the same distance and get into, you know, everything else. You can get into the... Um, you can get into deer, bear, you know, in some fairly good areas. And some of the best areas in California, they're really not that far from us. So it we're kind of a hub and a lot of people don't realize it, but you know, we are in the kind of in the middle. We're not hunting, you know, I'm not going on Wilshire and on Weston and trying to hunt, you know, something on the corner. Cause there's really no, you know, it's just concrete and there's the only animals are there are people that are, you know, just out of their mind locals. But, uh, the occasional very well-fed rat. Yeah, sure. right. So, you know, something you're not sure if it's a rat or a possum. But um, <laughs> there are advantage, realistically, you know, and some people utilize it and some people don't. But um, a lot of people just, you know, there's people that have moved here that I've talked to. You know, they, they come from a, a dominant, you know, hunting culture type state, you know, where it's just a, that's what you did. You know, you hunt, you know, hunting season comes around and, and the regular shop talk is like, Hey, did you get a tag or what, you know, what'd you get? Or, you know, it, and, uh, you know, here it's a, it's a smaller community, but it still exists, you know, and some people move here and they just think, Oh, my hunting's over, you know, I'm done. And, uh, you know, it's still here. You just got to look for it. And I think you just got to look a little harder, but, um, we do have an advantage of, um, it doesn't take long to get out of the city, you know. It doesn't really, to get to to in you know some hunting area it, to to hunt to fish to whatever it is you're into. Um, I mean, the, uh, an island, Catalina Island, that's off our our coast is loaded with deer, buffalo, deer, um, and getting tags not really that hard. So it's uh, something that just people you know overlook. So you just have you have to be creative, and it's like any other place. Um, don't think what the gossip or what everybody's thinking, like go buy the reg, you know, go get the regs, read it cover to cover, start talking to a few people. And then, you, you know, you'll just realize like, wow, you know, there, there's hunting everywhere. You just got to look for it. That's all it is. So do you feel like since you've been out here that you, um, because you do have to be a little more creative and do you feel like you appreciate, uh, appreciate it more when you do find a good spot or get oh, out totally. or take yeah. an animal here. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, no one really gives up their spots, you know, especially when you're in like, you know, out of state areas, people just, they take that to the grave. They pass it down in their wills and that's about it. Um, <laughs> it's even, it's even more so here, you know, and, and the thing is, is, um, you're sharing the, the other part is you have to co-mingle with, you know, you might go to the trailhead and there's 15 vehicles and only, you know, you might be the only hunter. You know, that's the other part. And that's that's somewhat of an obstacle, but um, it's an advantage. Like, if you go to New Mexico during hunting, hunting season and you go to a certain trailhead during the season, the hikers know to stay out of the, you know, they just don't go out that much during hunting season. You get to the trailhead and there's eight quads there. You know that every one of those quads is your, comp, you know, basically your competition. And hopefully they're ethical hunters and not shooting over each other. And they're not like, you know, if you you see somebody stalking a deer, you go the other way or you sit and watch. You know, um, here, when you get to the trailhead, and you see it, it's full and you took the last spot, there's, there's a good chance that you might be the only hunter. Like that's an advantage. And they stay on the trails, you know, 90% of them, they're not bushwhacking up some cliff and going up and over like that. There's all, and there's some places where people probably have not touched. I guarantee there's some areas where you're going to walk in there and, you know, shed hunting's not even big here. That's the other beauty of it. You can go into some areas where you're just like, oh, my God, the deer have been dropping their sheds here for 10 years and no one's been here. Huh. And you're just like, you know, I don't even know if I can carry all these. You know, I've, I've found areas like that where there's areas where I've walked past, I don't know how many times, and then thought, you know, that looks like a pretty good, you know, 600 feet of elevation to climb and, you know, and, you know, get up to the top of it. And it's just like, you know, oasis of no one's ever been there. Literally no one's ever been. You see deer animal trails going back and forth and you see no real trails. Like, but they are advantages that, 
you know, people look at it as competition, but it's not. It's like, fine, let the, let the hikers stay on the trails. The animals are used to that. You know, you could literally, like, let 30 people go hike an area that you're going to go hunt because they're not going to go hiking where you're hunting. You know, you're going to go a little farther in and probably above them, and they're going to stay below you. And if anything, you can time it right where if you know there's a bunch of people going in a certain area, you get on the other side of a saddle, and they just push a bunch of deer to you. You know, that it, you just have to be a little more creative. But we almost have that advantage over other places because a lot of hunting, you know, quote-unquote, you know, areas that we don't that you don't have the hikers you know you don't have and maybe colorado like there's areas where during hunting season there's a bunch of hikers everywhere else you know that when you pull up the trail and you see it like most people when they pull up and they see that many quads they just go to the next spot here it's like great cool you know there's a bunch <laughs> of people here and you look at you start looking at trucks i mean i do it all the time i look at all the vehicles i'm like oh there's no hunting, the there's, no, there's no hunting stickers <laughs> and there's no you know i don't see any camo seats <laughs> you know and it and uh but, you know, you see a bunch of Supers, you know, parked up there. You know, you're in probably good shape. Most people look at that as like, oh, my God, this is going to be horrible. I don't. I, I, I'm I, like, great. This is this is awesome. Because, for one, I took the last spot. And that means if there was a hunter that's going to come up here behind me, he's not going to be able to park anywhere. He's going to go to the next spot. And I'm up here with a bunch of, you know, non-hunters that I'm going to just, I'm going to be in areas that they just don't exist. You know, every now and then you'll run into a Boy Scouts group you know like some boy scouts or eagle scouts or whatever they are they tend to go they don't use trails half the time and they'll come through but they're the ones that when they when they meet up with you like oh you're hunting that's cool you know and then they'll be like hey we just saw a deer over here you know they, they're they're over there scouting for you so um it, it is that i think it's more of an advantage and most people think of it as like you know like i was saying before people come here from other places and it's you know obviously la's not known for hunting but it uh you know, that's the biggest advantage. I mean, you could be the only per- I mean, think about it. It's like going to an area, hunting's like there are some animals still, and you're the only one hunting. You know, everybody else is just running around, you know, camping. That's it. Hmm. So you do have an advantage, I think. So you really were the one that got me turned on to the idea of, uh, I don't want to say big game hunting, but mm-hmm. the idea of kind of this this Western style of hunting, mm-hmm. the the spot and stock hunting. As far as I was concerned, like I kind of knew it existed, but mm-hmm. in my mind, it was always this like unreachable, unreachable thing totally. that was like, oh wow, that's what everybody thinks you don't do this unless you've been hunting for no. twenty years yeah. and you have guides or you have a lot of money. Yeah, that's the other thing. It's like everybody thinks like, oh yeah, yeah, like big game hunting. Oh yeah, like you know that you, they think land order tags. Everybody thinks like, oh man, I got to get a guide. I got to spend this. I got to spend that. It's like, you know what? You can if you lived in California, you can you can leave the state and hunt big game and with gas and everything else. And you take a buddy and you share a couple costs. You know, a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars. You're hunting. That includes the tag, everything. I mean, it's over the counter, and it's not. You know, maybe it's a a good draw unit. Um, some states are easier to draw than people think, and it doesn't mean you have to. You know, if you're elk hunting, you don't have to go to you know unit sixteen in New Mexico and try to you know or any of the sixteens and and try to get the biggest you know four hundred bull or four forty bull. Like you can get a cow tag and go to Colorado and like you know and and do do that route you don't have to sit here and apply for tags um for utah and think that you know okay this unit takes 20 years this other unit takes 16 years arizona is like if you know 22 years and i you know, i can get unit 9 or unit 10 um you can get a cow tag in unit 10 and go sit there and watch during the rut and watch all these bulls lose their mind and be able to experience all that and pattern them and watch them and still go in there and take a cow and get the experience of getting an animal out and breaking an animal down and you can do this every single year and while you're doing this every single year you can put in for the tag of a lifetime or your lifetime tag and then when you do get that tag you have all that experience under your belt versus that guy that's like Nope, I'm just going to put in for these tags. And ten, in 10 years, he puts in for those tags, and then now he's got to go dust off the gun that he hasn't shot in 10 years. And he takes it to the range the week before and you know fires off a couple rounds. and like, yeah, that'll do it. And then when he gets out there, he can't make it up and down the hills because he can't carry the pack. And then if, he, if, if some you know, lotto moment happens to where he actually does take an animal, um, packing the thing out is like, you know, 
he might as well just give up because it's just it, it's not happening. He's he's in there he, even with friends and he's trying to get this thing out. Doesn't know how to break it down. Doesn't have any experience. Where the guy you know the guy next to him that he he's cut his teeth on everything that he could take down and get a tag for. Whether you know he he forget the antlers. Go with antlerless tags. They're available. You get, there's archery hunts that you can get in, like, the best units. And if you go after a cow, it's like they just hand you the tag in a lot of those places. I mean, you can go get them over the counter, and you're just experience, experience, experience. And carrying a female cow is just going to be the same amount of weight as a as a bull cow. So it might just be one less trip. <laughs> but, you know, the same thing for, you know, deer or antelope, you know, I- anything else. It's going to it makes way more sense to do that and it's just avail it's there and it's available and a lot of people think like well it's big game hunting i can't do that i don't have the time i don't have the gear like you don't need to go out and buy like the you know you can go out and buy a kafaro pack if you want to and buy it brand new or you could go out and buy a used one or you can just get a pack that like you know that it's going to work throw a bunch of rocks in it and and sandbags and see okay like i can't carry 100 pounds I'm I'm not I'm just not that person. But I can carry sixty pounds and start doing the math. All right, if I carry sixty pounds and I gotta break down an elk, if I'm by myself, that's gonna take three days. <laughs> but <laughs> but you know, the the will, you know, there's there's people who have done it, you know, and that's the that's the whole part. You don't that's need to buy one of everything. Those interesting things where it's like you can you you know, you're talking about okay, you know, you wanna get out and do this every year. You can you can prepare for this at home as as much as you want. Like you know, I fill up my pack and I go, I go jogging and hiking through mm-hmm. the Hollywood Hills and I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm hitting some rather vertical stuff, yep. but there's, there's an additional element that will never be there unless you're out in the backwoods doing this every year. And it's, yeah, you can develop some of that mental toughness just by forcing yourself mm-hmm. to get out, but it's, it's a different situation when you're out there and you, you develop certain skills to to adapt for that and really i feel like there's a mental toughness that you will never get just by going to the gym even mm-hmm. you know even if you're going in your boots and your pack and yeah you're, it's not the same you're doing everything it's i mean just, you might fit it you can you can get muscles and you obviously you don't want to bulk up because that's just more weight that you have to carry and i'm i'm a big dude like i'm 270 pounds five nine i'm not exactly like you know lean um the last thing i want to do is carry more you know more weight than i want to you know but the uh the uh, you know throwing a pack on going on like it's nothing is ever going to replace going you know throwing a pack on and, and putting your boots on and, and literally you know actually doing it and you know where we are closer to sea level you know even the hills around here that we would hunt in are going to be a higher elevation i mean hell there's a hill by my house that's almost a thousand feet of elevation you know within a mile you know a mile and a quarter you know you go about a mile and a quarter you get about you know almost a thousand it's a pretty pretty good steep hill but um you know some people train like crazy you know almost marathon type training and they're training at sea level and then they go like yeah you know i gotta i gotta hunt in colorado and i'm i'm training for it i'm like yeah this is gonna be fun so (laughs) basically like all those muscles that you're conditioning aren't going to get any type of oxygen like let's see how they do with that you know unless you're wearing a training mask because i i do the training mask that actually helps quite a bit you know while i'm training you know here so it kind of simulates being high elevation but um, nothing is ever going to replace not saying you shouldn't because i still think that you should train you should work out i mean your your back and your legs is what you survive on. You don't need to go, you know, elk don't care if you have big biceps, you know. They're not attracted to that kind of stuff, so it's not going to matter. Um, but, you know, your legs will, your, your, if your legs fail, your knees fail, your hip flexors is the the one thing that I guarantee that every hunter that has probably never taken an animal before has never thought about is they keep thinking about the hill, the up the hill like i got to get up this hill got to get up this hill put a put 80 pounds on your back and try to get down the hill and then try to get down the hill without trekking poles um a whole new experience like you're you're going to get this new muscle that you didn't even know you had called the hip flexor and it's going to light on fire and you're you're just you're going to try not to fall on your face and then if you do fall on your face i hope you can do a push up with 80 pounds on your back and get back on your feet um so the training's important but you have to get up there. You have to get on, like, you have to side hill. There's times where you just go up there and you side hill all day long because once you get to a hunt, no matter where it is, California, Arizona, you get up in these high areas and 
the, the animals aren't just sitting there at the trailhead like, all right, I'm next to get shot, raise their hand, and you shoot them. You know, they're, the more hunters there are, the farther back they are, and they just they get in the nastiest, ugliest, you know, during the rut, they get a little dumb where they just like, you know, they, they throw caution to the wind and they're just like thinking about her and that's all they're thinking about. You know, they just want to have sex and, and beat up other bulls and that's all they're thinking about. It turns into a bar basically out in the woods. Um, but other times, I mean, once the rut's over, the bulls, like, they get away from the cows and even the bucks do the same thing. They they get away from the does and they go into the nastiest, rockiest, you know, there's places that... you. You know, people think, oh, yeah, there's there's a ridge. You know, there's there's a bull right there. And, you know, that I can make that shot. You know, there's all these long-range guns that everybody's getting that, you know, they just turn a dial and they can make the shot. Um, but most people don't, you know, they don't realize, like, okay, fine, you can hit that animal. But now you got to go over there and get what it. Are you gonna and do you, now you've got to lose, you know, 2,000 feet of elevation down to this ravine, cross a river. Now you're soaking wet unless you figure out a plan of, of getting across, you know, somewhat dry, you're taking your boots off and rolling your, you know, everything up trying to get across this thing. Then now you got to climb back up the same elevation, get to the top, go through, you know, you know, blow downs and rocks and s- slides and everything else. And now once you get to it, you're, you basically need a nap, you know, even somebody in shape gets to the other side. I don't care if you're Cameron Haynes, you can get to that other side and you're like, okay, that was, that was a little bit of a trek. You know, I need a little bit of a break. And obviously Cameron Haynes takes two minutes and he's back to normal and I take two hours. (laughs) But the, uh, you know, the the fact of the matter is that, you know, you, you get to the other side and then you're just like, holy mackerel. This is like, it's a, it's a, it's a horse, you know, with somebody glued antlers on its head. And you're just thinking like, okay, so maybe it won't be that bad. And then the first, and if you do know how to break it down, you you, you take one leg off, one quarter, and you got to lift that quarter up to cut off the rest and get around the ball joint. And when you lift that up, you realize that you can't lift that with one arm, you know, because, and even when you're fairly strong, you can kind of hold it for a little while, but you you have to lift it enough to like get around the ball joint and cut. And that's why it's really hard with one person or if you doing it one person with no cord or, any, or no tree to tie it to. Um, and then you start realizing, wow, you know, I, I got to get this one quarter, which is only a small piece. And then you got to take another quarter and then you got the front quarters and then you have the back straps and the, um, you know, you got to take all the neck meat and everything, you know, you're, you're just thinking like, and it's trip. And then you got to, Every trip, you're going down that thing, through the river, back up the other side, you know. And then people that don't know what they're doing also is, like, they, they take a shot at an animal underneath them and think, like, you know, you really, unless you really have to, you shouldn't hunt down. Because you got to go down. and Now you're going down with no weight and coming up with weight. You know, that that's the a lot of things. And these are a lot of things. I mean, you can... You can read all the books you want. You can take all the courses you want. You'll pick up on a lot of stuff, and you'll have way more advantage than people that came before us that didn't have this stuff. But you really, you know, you have to go out there and experience it. But if Nothing you cut your teeth, that experience yeah. In the but field. if you cut your teeth on some smaller animals, you know, go go get a doe. Like you get a doe out on one trip, and it'll suck. You know, like that one, if it's your first time, you're just like, wow, that doe kicked my ass. I can't even think about what an elk's going to do. Go go on a hog hunt. Get a javelina. I mean, you throw those things in your pocket. You know, they're so small. But, <laughs> you know, it, it's one of those things like, you know, if it's a small enough animal and you're just, you look at the terrain before you pull the trigger and just be like, you know what? And and that's the other thing is, is the guys that take elk every year and take big animals or just take consistent animals, they still look at it. They look at that ravine like, oh, man, this is going to – this this will suck. And then they pull the trigger, and they just do it. Because realistically, like, you know, well, they, they've done it before, and they know that it's going to suck, but at least they know they have the ability to do it. And then they just grind it out, and that's where the mental toughness comes in. Yep. It's like – it's literally like, uh, you know what? It's going to suck. I've done it before. Um, I'm going to put all this weight on my back and then you go over there and you get it and it's on your back and you're just like, you have the relief of like, I took an animal, but you don't have, but now you're just like the, if you know, because you've done it before, you're just like, man, that was the easy part. And you know, killing an elk is easy if you can find them. That's the whole thing. So most people never find them. They hear them, the bugle, they over bugle thing disappears and never get it but like if he's sitting right there that's a big ass target and like even bad shots a small car yeah and even (laughs) yeah exactly it's like even bad shots you know you have a target that's huge and uh even people that can't shoot straight get an elk every now and then so it's just like um 
but getting that, you know, getting it back, you know, that, that's the whole. Well, I thing. feel like to some extent, it's one of those things where if you think about everything that's going to, yeah, you want to make a wise shot and you want to mm-hmm. make some wise decisions. Yeah. But it's, I feel like also it's one of those things to some extent you have to focus on the moment because the second you start looking at stuff and you're, you know, you're getting towards the end of your hunt and you see that elk and you're like, how, you know, it's like, yeah, how am I going to, how am I going to get this thing out? Mm -hmm. You start doubting yourself and you, you think, well, okay, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't take that shot when, you know, you take it step by step. You're like, okay, no, no, I can, I'm going to get that elk out. I'll figure it out. Well, and that, and that's also to the point of, you know, you have to be confident, like, you you can't be out there running around chasing elk all the time. You know, the season's the season. And, you know, in, in reality, if a bunch of hunters got the smart idea, like, you know, the season's not going on, but I know where the elk are. Let's go check them out. And they're chasing, they're still bugling, chasing them around the, build, the, the mountain. When you come back to hunting season, those things are like, they're all freaked out because they've been like, wait a minute, like there's never been hunters here in, in July, you know, and uh, you, but but you can go shoot your bow. You can shoot your bow, and you can shoot your gun, and you can keep, you know, making that distance farther and farther and farther. You could be like Cameron Haynes, where he's just like, you know, I can hit a target at 100 yards. No, it doesn't mean I'm going to take that shot, but it's going to make me confident at 50. It's the same thing. Like I, I'm, I, I shoot a bow, a muzzleloader, and a rifle. I, if I had a choice, I would take a rifle every time because realistically, I, I want to bring meat back, and I'm not that guy that you know goes and. You know, I want a little bit more of a challenge, but um, I do have those options open because, like, you know, shooting. Shoot, if I shoot a bow, I have more opportunities. If there's muzzleloader seasons, uh, you know, I have I have opportunities. So that's the reason why I do it. But you have to be proficient in it, and that's the last thing you need to think about. Is like, you should be like looking at that, range it. Like, it's within your you know comfortable range. If it's not, get closer. And even if it is, get closer. If you can get closer, get closer. That's the whole thing. Isn't not one of those guys that's like they back up because they're like, oh, yeah, I am. I break my record for the longest shot. I don't care. I'll I'll shoot a bull in the face at three feet with a you know with a three hundred wind mag. I don't care. Like I'll I'll blow his antlers off. It doesn't matter. Like can't eat those anyway. Um, it, it's. Uh, the, the the ethical part of like taking the animal you know there's all this controversy all the time about you know oh well you shouldn't take a frontal shot with a with a bow it's like it's been done it's possible that it kills them like you know when you hit them right that you, you kill them well you I have to be somewhere that a, a frontal shot on an elk is the same size as a as a deer a on the side on a broadside right? exactly yeah and exactly and, you, and if you think about it like most of the guys that are complaining about it not anything i mean i i have i have plenty of relatives that that sit in a tree stand in the East coast and, you know, take deer and you look at the range. Um, most of the people that are complaining about taking a frontal shot are them. Like, yeah, you probably shouldn't take a frontal shot on a deer if you're 30 feet up in the air. Like the, you don't really have the shot unless the deer is on his hind legs looking at you. You know, that's not going to happen, but they don't understand. Like this is a bull elk coming up and over a ridge. And normally you're on like either the other side of a saddle or you're at the top of the ridge where he hasn't really figured it out until you're, you know, you're in front of a tree or a bush or whatever, and you're just kind of utilizing your camo. So he, he comes around the corner, he's thinking, you know, he's there to fight or, you know, there's a cow, and all of a sudden he just freezes up. When he freezes up, you have this chest that is bigger than human chest, and it is the it, it is the biggest target. And if you're using a rifle, that thing is toast. I mean, it's just ripping right through it. Heck, I could probably throw a knife and hit the right spot and kill this thing. You know, they get, you know you're within six feet or 20 feet or whatever it is, and, like, if you're proficient at 30 feet, you know, or 30 yards, uh, you're going to, you know, if you can put it in, 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 not even in the 10 ring, if you can put it, that thing in the eight, you're going to kill this animal, you know, ethically. And realistically, the guarantee less, like elk that have been shot in the chest correctly have run less than a broadside lung shot or heart shot, you know. Adrenaline. You hit a elk in the in the heart. The adrenaline. He can still run a couple hundred yards. Hell, mm-hmm. if you if you spook the you know if he beds down and you spook him, he might run a mile. You know they they just and they take one step. It's like us running. You know we're we're they walk faster than we can run. You know you can't. It's not like you're gonna chase you know chase them down too often. You know and that's the thing is like if that's the shot, that's the shot. You know sometimes that might be the only shot you got. But if you practice that. You know, they should make uh, – I haven't seen a 3D target yet that you can – you know, that has the 10 ring in the chest. It should. 
you know, it should be there. Cause, but a lot of people. I think just, we got a new business opportunity. Right? right here. Yeah, like we'll somebody. Like, whoever's listening, uh, we need a uh, 3D target with a 10 ring in the center. Reinhardt? Reinhardt? Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, we're uh, starting to run close on time. Um, one last one last closing question for you. Um, I've had a lot of people I've talked to. Um, they know, you know, I'm I'm still learning a lot. I'm kind mm-hmm. of starting out, and so they've they've asked me. Um, really, I guess, what would you what would you tell someone uh, who comes to you and says? Maybe maybe I'm an ex, uh, somewhat experienced hunter, but I've I've never done anything but but uh, hunt duck, or mm-hmm. I've I've only ever sat in a tree stand a couple of times, or even I've I've always wanted to do this. It's interested in me. I just I I just don't know how to even start. Mm-hmm. You know, I I live in the middle of the city. I I've got no one to ask. How do I how do I start? Well. You know, it, it, it all, everybody's going to be a little bit different. I mean, doing your research and you can read all the books and do all the podcasts and, and look at everything and, and get somewhat up to speed, but it's, it, it's nothing's going to replace a mentor. I mean, in reality, um, I've done it, you know, fully, <laughs> literally DIY and I've done it with people, you know, I re- well, I don't care if it's, uh, you're reaching out via email to somebody and they're just like, or it's a message board or it's somebody you can get on the phone with, or it's somebody that, you know, if you have a network, of, if you can somehow get into a network of people that hunt and get into the point where, you know, go get in shape and get to the point where you can pack out an elk and you end up being the asset. Because literally, like, once somebody finds out you can pack out an elk, you're the first person that gets called and they, they take something down. <laughs> and I'm I'm the first person that, you know, I'll drive. If somebody took an elk down in Colorado and called me right now. I would, you know, I'd have to tell the wife that uh, I'll be I'm going to be late. Because, you know, you go out and you pack it out. And that's the other thing. It's like, go out on hunts. You don't have to be the one pulling the trigger. You know, realistically, like, why why not go out with somebody? You know, somebody get, somebody's going to, a relative, a friend, an acquaintance, somebody, you know, came across on, you know, you talk to. On Find a, on, someone on Rock Slide. On, on Rock Slide or, or, you know, Randy Newberg's, uh, you know, you know, any of those forums. You know, you come across and you just, you know, you, you, you know, you meet up at, uh, at one of the conventions or whatever it is and you should, you know, should you sit there and talk to them, you know, just shoot hunting or whatever. And you might even find other people that are like, yeah, maybe they're just breaking into this whole thing. And you're going to find that, you know, that person that's either, you know, you, you want to find the mentor, you want to find the people that will feed you information. And then you can, you know, once you start climbing up the ladder, you're going to find people that need information and, and pass it along, like literally keep that ball rolling and then whether whoever it is if they go out on those hunts get on get on those hunts volunteer to go out on those hunts go on the camping trips and you know even the maybe you don't go on the hunt but you go on a scouting trip you know everybody wants you know no one really wants to go alone there's all these like solo hunter and they want to do this like a lot of a lot of people so i solo hunt out of necessity no one else wanted to go i went and that's not going to stop me. And that's what stops a lot of people like, oh, my God, I don't want to go up to the hills, a bunch of woods. The bear's going to eat me. Yeah. It, they, they, there's a you might win the lotto, too. You know, like it's about the probably same odds as, you know, getting eaten by a bear. Like, yeah, you're going to up your chances. Like, just don't go over there and poke him while he's sleeping, you know. Um, but you just you have to you have to just put yourself out there and you will learn so much more by just going out and doing it with you know, if you can get somebody, a buddy, a mentor or whatever, or t- just be the tag along, be the guy that drives, you know, designated driver then so they can sleep because they've been out hunting all day or whatever it is. There's people that have volunteered to be the, you know, camp cook, you know, during the guide <laughs> trip or whatever it is. And then, you know, whether they're doing a, a semi-guided, self-guided, um, fully guided, you know, you're gaining all that experience. Think about that. It's like if you could, if you could put a camera on you know there's obviously all these people that film what they do but if you could put a camera behind the scenes and hear all the little rhetoric and everything that goes back and forth and all the you know where they go why they're going there's a lot of stuff that doesn't end up on tv because the guides obviously they do this for a living they don't want to let their little secrets out but and it's not like you're going in as a spy and you're trying to learn stuff you're trying to learn the, the process and how things work and you know m- people wonder why i hike at night and I don't hike during the day. It's because I don't hike during the day when I'm hunting. 
Like, why would I hike? Why would why go on a hike now? I hike at night. Like, that's I go in and get to my spot before the sun comes up, and then I stay there if until the sun goes down. And I hike in at night and I hike out at night. I, you know, I'm like the king of of headlamps. You know, I buy them like, and I might as well buy them by the dozen. But it's it's uh, you learn those little things. You know, that's the whole thing. Is like you learn, and then you you get everything done at the same time. The process and how that works. And and if none of that's available. Just go do it. Just go, you know, there's nothing wrong. All right, fine. You don't have a tag. You can't have the money for the tag. No one is stopping you from scheduling a weekend during the rut in whatever state. I mean, we're in L.A. It doesn't take long to get to Arizona and go camping during the rut. Get get some camo on, put an orange hat on, and get a pair of binoculars. You're not hunting. You don't have a tag. You don't have a, a weapon. No one's going to mess with you. If anything, you're going to sit up and find a high point, and all you're going to do is, and if you get in a good enough area, you're going to be like, there's an elk, there's a deer, that, you know, and you're going to watch them, and you're going to understand what they're doing, and then you're going to watch hunters, and you're going to watch <laughs> the bad ones, the good ones, the ones that know what they're doing, the guys that Rambo in and just run in there and start shooting, the guys that take 25 shots at a, an elk and never even hit it because they're trying to shoot too far, and then you see the guys that are like, holy cow, that guy stalked all, he could have touched that thing and shot it, you know, he, he didn't even need the bow, he just stabbed it with an arrow because <laughs> he got that close. You'll see all that stuff, and you'll bugle, and you can, there's nothing, I mean, I wouldn't go out and start bugling if there's a bunch of hunters around because you might get shot, but, or you, or that's when you wear your, uh, your fuzzy hat. Yeah. Make sure you too. wear, make sure you wear, um, brown and no orange at all. And, uh, you know, make sure you just kind of like stay in the bushes where no one can really recognize you. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> but great advice. from but, Jess Sampson. Yeah, exactly. It's great advice. If you get shot, you know, it's on me. That's, but uh, should but, we submit that to the, uh, Bowman for gritty? Yeah, gritty totally. tech tip for that's definitely season? a gritty tech tip. Um, but, it is a totally under underutilized. I barely know anybody that do that does this, and it's if you don't have a tag and you don't have that opportunity, and it, and if say you do have a tag, say you have a tag in the fall, like late later, like you have a late hunt, late rifle hunt, and wherever it is, nothing's keeping you from you know that September, mid September. You can go to any. You can drive to Oregon. You can drive, I mean, especially in California. We can go and go in a couple different directions. New Mexico, you know, Oregon. Like some of the best elk hunting is really not that far from us. I mean, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, a little bit farther, but um, we can get there. I mean, you could drive to Arizona tonight and be there before the sun comes up. So um, nothing's keeping you from you. Just go there. Sp- test out your gear. Take all your gear and and you know see if the jet boy you got on eBay works. Mm-hmm. And you know learn how to start a fire without matches and, you know, do all that stuff that you would probably end up having to do anyway, at least you should be doing if you're new to this whole thing. But while you're doing it, why not be in the middle of the elk and see, you know, you might, you might get to some areas where you don't see a lot of hunters and all of a sudden you run into a bunch of elk and you're like, all right, I'm a, I got this, you know, Corey Jacobson thing that, supposed to make noise and sound like an animal and you start blowing on that thing and you sound like you're letting air out of a balloon and but they just think it's something different so they come and see what you're doing you know that's the whole thing i would i would try to practice it before you get out there so you can sound like at least by a drunk elk and and (laughs) and you know at least get to that point but well, um, that's the that'll definitely get the bull elks out. As well, the, you know, the drunk female yeah, elk it, call. You know, that's the one. that might that. Oh, Corey, might, you know, uh, Jason Phelps might want to know about that. The drunken cow call. So. I have decided I do uh, after your comment earlier. I do want to open a bar called the Rut. That's that's my that's my plan for the future at this mm-hmm. point. Uh, mostly just full of drunk guys fighting over women. No, totally. Yeah. That's a, a good bar name. Like, just call it the rut. The rut. Yeah. So, 100, 100 but, only, but you know, the 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 thing is, is um, a lot of people that are new to it, you know, they do. The, the, there's that intimidation factor. I mean, you described yourself as like you did, really didn't realize it until before that you it was within your reach, and it is. It's totally within your reach. You you can go to the Salvation Army and go buy some old camo. And a you know a jacket and it'll be heavy and it won't be that efficient and it's not it doesn't dry once you're wet you're wet but so be it you might as well buy the twenty dollar poncho that comes with it that's you know heavy as hell but like y- you still can go do it you know and you can go out and you can figure out the only you know if save if you're gonna save up on anything save up on boots so your feet stay decent and you can if you want you can buy used boots you know and you can work your way up. Um, Really, you could you could run around in the woods naked 
and just as long as you got the right pair of boots on, uh, and I, and it, and the right pair of boots for me might be different for you. Like you might be wearing crispies and I wear Loa's and somebody else might want Kenetrex. Like that's the other thing. Don't let somebody's like, Oh, these are the best boots ever. You need these. Like, uh, Kenetrex don't fit my feet. I think they're great, but they just don't fit. And Loa's and crispies fit my feet. You know, that, that's another thing is like, um, a, a mentor, the right mentor will actually, they're not going to say, Oh, you need exactly this gear, this, they're just going to say, well, you can pick, you know, this headlamp or this headlamp or you can you can go to home depot and buy a headlamp for 20 bucks and i guarantee that it'll you know it, it'll have light light will come out of it and you, you'll be able to see they're going to tell you why you need it and, yeah exactly and what you're gonna help and, you figure yeah, out what and you're, 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 you're better off like i i learn more about and in every trip i go on i learn i come back and i'm just like this piece of gear was cool this was a complete waste of time you know this worked this didn't you know or this might have been I, I this might have been touch. too much. Yo, well, I'm kind of past the point of like, I, I've done that before. Every time I come home and uh, I start going through stuff, like it's usually clothing. Like I usually mm-hmm. take extra stuff, but now it's different. Like it stays in the truck, you know, and I look at stuff like, man, I never even busted this out into that. You know, I, I five days, I just need, uh, you know, an extra pair of socks, extra pair of boxers, and then the clothes that I'm wearing. I never change it. You know, you don't need to change anything. If you wear, And that's the difference between, you know, the gear that's available nowadays, the merino wool, the synthetics. You know, one's going to dry fast. One's not going to stink. One keep you warm, wet. One might not. Like, you kind of have to, you know, balance that. But it just depends on what you're doing. If you're going in September and it's rut, you really don't need all this high tech stuff. You don't need a big. You need like you might need a puffy jacket, you know, or puffy vest for that matter. It'd probably not even be that cold. Just depends on where you're going, how what the elevation is. But you can borrow stuff. That's the other thing. Like it just depends on if you who you know, and you don't need to borrow stuff from your hunter buddy. You, know, you might not have a hunter buddy, but you might have uh, somebody that goes hiking and camping all the time. They might have a, a jet boil. They might have a backpack. They might have a tent. They might have, you know, a sleeping bag. Like, just find it, you know, and, and that's the thing is, like, you could you can borrow some stuff. Or if you do go out with somebody else, like, maybe they just have extra stuff. Like, I always have extra sleeping bags and, you know, well, I gave my sleeping bag, my extra sleeping bag to a homeless guy the other day. So that was a... Uh, <laughs> That was my little good deed, but, you know, and I do, that. that's part of my gear testing. I drive around L.A., give uh, homeless people some gear, and then I go back and check with them, like, hey, how's that jet boil doing? Um, <laughs> seems to... Uh, I, I was wondering what was going on in Lincoln <laughs> yeah, Park the half, other day. Half, yeah, it, 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 it's, uh, I'm still in the middle of this whole testing, and it's not, you know, like, half the time they look at me like, oh, I sold it, or I lost it, or it was stolen, and then once in a blue moon, like, the backpack, the guy has it, it's rolled up, he's all, like, totally appreciated, you know, that he got it, and it's all stoked or whatever, but, um, yeah, it's a... Like you, you know, say you live in L.A. I guess our advantage is we got a lot of homeless people that test gear for us. So you know, if you go in certain areas, you see a bunch of. Every time I go, I get off the freeway in certain areas, and I see all those tents under the freeway. I'm always checking out what kind of tents they got. I don't know why. It's just one of those things where I'm just like, you know, looking, and then I'll, you know, I'll like, whoa, 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 you know, what's going over there? Like they got, you know, a big Agnes tent. Like, you know, how'd that dude get that thing? You know, and then I'm looking in there, see if they got any pads or what they're, you know. It's one of those weird things. So I guess that's another advantage, you know, living in L.A. <laughs> Easy. Plenty of gear testing opportunities. Yeah. But. but, you know, the whole thing is, like, if you uh, if you get off the couch, you know, turn off turn off the hunting channel and uh, never watch it again if you don't want to. Uh, you you can get online You can and just put your boots on, go hiking, get out there. You don't have to even have a tag or a gun the first couple of times if you want to. Like... I, it's almost a it's almost a freedom if you can go out and think about it, if you go out in the woods and you don't have that you know everybody has the anxiety stress i don't care how many animals you've taken but you're always thinking like you know god i can't find an animal and then when you get an animal like oh i gotta take this animal, you know like i'm i'm you get a little nervous you know you know the anticipation of it and then you're just like you know you're or you're chasing bugles and you're like this stupid bull like like first he's here then he's over there and then you realize it wasn't it was two different ones and then you're running all over the place and you feel like they're just messing with you and it's something personal you know and you're going through all this stuff in your head like what i do and the what i do wrong like everybody they should have mountain confessions they should have like this like whole show based on hunters that are up on the hill after they've made a stock and it didn't go right and they're confessing on everything like man did i did i do this wrong did i win me did he you know did my wind checker like was it the that you know, that when I took that leak, do you think he smelt that? Like, you know, all these different things, um, there should just be a show on that. But 
if you go out there and you don't have a tag, all that goes away. It literally goes away. And the only thing you have is a pair of binoculars and, you know, maybe you got a phone scope or something like that with a spotting scope and you're just filming this whole thing. You, there is no TV show. There is no, you know, no course on online that's going to teach you the stuff that you're going to learn. And the mm-hmm. thing you mentioned about before, like, you know, like putting a, a deer to bed, you know, like, uh, you know, you get to watch like where they feed, where they bed, where they, you know, you start finding these little triangles like, okay, he beds here, he eats here, he, t- he drinks water out of that area. And you start thinking like, wow, he just keeps doing that. That's a pattern. And if you can sit on a deer for like two, three days, like which guys do it, the, the best guys out there, they'll sit on a deer for three, four days, you know, sometimes. And then just like, they're either waiting for him to make a mistake or they're patterning him like, well, he... When he goes over there to take a drink, I'm going to go sit over there where he eats. And then when he walks over to, you know, get something to eat, I'm going to shoot him. Or I'm going to sit in front of his bed when he comes back to bed. You know, you're, gonna, you're basically trying to cut him off in those areas. That's the best way to do it if you can find that perfect situation. And, uh, but if you can just sit up there and watch it. And there's guys all the time that, you know, they talk about it. You can listen to podcasts and you'll hear it every now and then. And most people don't pick up on it. But they're like, yeah, you know, we were shed hunting. We saw this elk. Or we were we were on this hunt guiding and we, you know, the guy was, you know, we were deer hunting, but we kept seeing these elk on this other ridge. And then during the elk season, we went over there and got that, that, you know, whether it was that particular elk or that was just the hang for those, those type of elk. But while they're doing this, you know, looking for mule deer or what coos deer or whatever they were looking for, they saw that and they thought like, well, he's here now. He maybe he stays in the area or they know at least where he's going to go. A bunch of snow fell. He went down an elevation. He's right on the, you know, the snow line, but they knew that, you know, that that's what it was. And if you're just sitting out there, you know, you, you, you take a trip and you're camping for the weekend, get to see a bunch of elk, get to hear and sound with, you know, you get to hear them talk to each other. And that's the other thing is like, they're not quiet. They don't sneak around. Most people like sneak around for elk. And I always laugh like, they don't. They, they make noise. If you snuck up on them, and just like they didn't really hear much, but they could smell you, then they're gonna really kind of freak out. But if they hear crack, 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 and you know you're raking and you're stomping your feet and you're cracking a you know limb here and there and you're breaking limbs that are you know logs that are on the ground on purpose because when they step on something that's like you know six to a thousand pounds of weight that comes down on a Jeez. on a log and it explodes. And you hear that kind of stuff, and they're not, you know, you're walking through the, you're, you you kick a rock, and a bunch of rocks go down, and you cow call a little bit, and, you know, the elk hear that, and they kind of, oh, I heard the cow, and, you know, the cow over there, no big deal, you know, and... Um, you're not going to get a cow that's, all you that's, gotta, that's totally what you silent do. when yeah, it's exactly. walking, but suddenly yeah, there's no, bugling. Yeah, there's, there's, the, there is the, the ninja elk that you called the, you know, he bugles, you bugle, you're sitting there and all of a sudden he shows up to your left like a raptor and you're just like, oh wow, how the heck did that happen? They will, (laughs) that's when they'll do the silent part, but just them out doing what they do and just moving around, they're not really that quiet and that's the whole thing and you'll learn that by being out there and being observant and I literally think that the best thing any new hunter could do is go out to leave your rifle at home. Don't even get a tag. Get your girlfriend, get your, you know, whoever and let's go camping but let's do it in september <laughs> and let's go to the trail and let's be that person at the trailhead with the subaru and uh you know people trying to figure out why we're here and you're just camping and the, the other thing is you're going to run into people you might run into locals and you tell them what they're doing they i guarantee they're going to be like wow that's an interesting idea they've never even thought of that and you might even get some you know, information on the unit. They might be like, yeah, we see cows here all the time. You'll run into hunters. The best hunters are the run into the deer hunters that don't elk hunt. You know, for me, I'm more of the, the elk hunter. I'll deer hunt, but I'm more of the elk hunter. But it's great when I run into mule deer guys because there's like, oh, yeah, there's stupid elk over here. You know, <laughs> the thing's huge. Like, damn house running around over there. You know, we're trying to sneak up on this thing. It just comes walking through and deer took off. But he's always here every time we come here. And, you know, you're thinking like, oh, cool. Yeah, that's cool. And then just like, that's where I'm going. And then all of a sudden, you know, hey, I'll take care of that elk <laughs> for you if you tell me where it is. They're just, they're going to tell you a pattern of what he does and where he eats and where he drinks and where he comes from and like what ridge he came up and over. You know, they might spill the beans because in reality, if that elk is gone the next season and they come in to get that, you know, the, their deer that they've been hunting for multiple years, you just took care of their elk problem and everybody wins. So that that's also something is that whole networking and and hunters have this kind of bond of, you know, yeah, they don't 
give their spots, but they, man, they, they, they'll give up somebody else's spot (laughs) (laughs) and they will, uh, and, and they will give you, you know, not everybody's elk hunter, not everybody's a deer hunter. They're held people that hunt sheep and have no interest. They've, they've got the bug and they, you know, sheep and goat hunters, they run into elk and they'll tell you exactly where they are. They're like, yep, they're right there. You know, they're up on this hill and, you know, and a lot of deer hunters will do the same thing, especially when they know that like that's all you're into. Is, you know, you hunt elk and that's all it is. You run into another elk hunter, like you, you'll be able to share some stuff, but he's not going to tell you, which yeah. is, is fair. And that's the whole thing is like you don't want to be given this. You want to earn it and you want to learn your own spots. You know, that's the other thing is, you know, some guides and some people, even some mentors, they'll be like, this is not where I hunt, but I'm going to show you a spot. You can do whatever you want to with it, and if it's up to you if you're going to share this spot. But just to you know, just so you know, if you share this with Tom, Tom might bring his buddy Bob, and then Bob has a buddy, and so on and so forth. The next thing you know, there's no elk here, so you can do whatever you want. But I hunt, and they'll tell you like I hunt on the other ridge, and I don't want to see you over there. But I've seen a lot of elk on this side. Have at it, you know. And that's a that's a respect thing, and they do do that from time to time. And that's more of a mentor, like. I hunt here, you hunt there, I'll help you out. You can call me anytime you want. Hell, I'll help you pack it out if you need to. That That's a huge, and that's usually having that person that's a local. You know, They, they live there, they live in the area, they know the area. And locals are like, if you can get in with a local and, and know somebody, whether they're a friend of a, it, they come in the weirdest times where they're like a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend that works for one of your relatives or whatever it is. But, you know, they there it, it's a network and you know it, it it exists the same thing as those tags and the hunts exist and if you can figure that out and you you're open about it you're gonna it's it's just like trying to find you know private property permissions in on the east coast you gotta knock on 10 doors to find one you know but if you don't knock on any doors you don't hunt it's the same thing like you got to get out and network in any way i when i went to idaho this year i had a unit 44 bull um tag which i you know i didn't fill this year but um, awesome hunt, like uh, just fun. Had wolf encounter, two wolf encounters, and a bear encounter, a, a really big bear encounter. Um, and you know, got into some elk until the wolves messed it up. But uh, I, you know, when I was scouting in July, and my hunt it was in October, but I was out there scouting in July. I, you know, go to this little tiny diner. It was the only diner in the whole town. Sitting there eating, and I got to talking with. A bunch of farm farmers, you know, from ranchers that are in that area. They were blown away that I even drew that tag. And, and the fact that they, they were giving me a hard time because I had California plates, <laughs> you know. But I had a Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation license plate cover, which I guess was the end with those guys. They're like, oh, okay, you know, he's from California, but he's cool. And uh, Almost get a little more credit. Back, <laughs> right? Like, well, no, and, and and it's always the same thing. Like, I just got back from Utah for, from one of the hunting shows, the conservation show, and it's the same thing. You know, I got somebody, you know, one person asking me, like, you know, I thought camo was illegal in California, kind of joking around, and then just all this other stuff. But the fact that I was there and the fact that I was, you know, sitting there talking to these people and, and we were talking about the same thing, shed hunting and, and gear and, and, and just, you know, feeding off each other. And I never, you know, I'm never, I'm always learning. That's kind of my idea is like I, I'm always learning, but I'm always the first person to pass on that knowledge to anybody that wants, you know, if you want to hear it and whether you, you know, it's not the last word and there's other opinions, but, you know, all what I know, I'll pass pass on and you can take it for what it's worth but they're the same way they they were the, you know the, the same way and it's never like there's never any controversy on you know you think that you should hunt this way and i think you should hunt that way and bump heads it's just like that hunter community is like yeah you like hunting coyotes that's cool you know I'm, a, I'm an elk hunter or you might even have two elk hunters like you know you you shoot you shoot a compound i shoot a recurve even that wall's kind of come down like that used to be the whole like oh man like you know should recurve that that's dumb like compound bow take that thing out from 60 yards and you gotta like you gotta get up close enough to stab the thing with the knife that, that it to each his own you know that's the whole thing like it, it's like aaron snyder just did that whole year of like i'm gonna tra- I'm, I'm gonna challenge myself <laughs> and it, yeah it came up with all these things and they got it he got he got a lot he poor aaron got a lot of flack for going into this thing Leaving the compound bow and going in the struggle stick, um, and I'm gonna use the term because I think it's funny. Um, oh, it's hilarious! But I it's love it. you know he goes through and it, like he he busted his butt to 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 learn it, and he went to the people and he he walked into you know 
he, he walked into a place and went through all these bows and finally narrowed it down to, you know, two or three and then finally narrowed it down to one and then learned how to shoot it and went to people that are like, you're shooting it wrong, you're sh- you know, do this and listened. And then when he corrected and went back and, and practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced, probably, you know, from what Brian Call says is probably more than most people practice, you know, any weapon. I mean, he was just crazy about it. And then he goes out and he goes on hunts and like some were successful and some of them weren't, you know, and he says he's wounded more animals than he's ever wounded in one season, which can't be easy for the guy, but then people are beating him up for that. You know, so now he got, he got beat it from going to the recurve and dropping the compound bow, but he was, get, he did this because some people are like, well, you know, you, yeah, you kill a lot of animals, but I bet you can't do it with a recurve. So yeah, he's like, okay, cool challenge and does it. And then, then now he's like, he comes back and he's like picking up, you know, he gets a new Hoyt and or a couple of new Hoyts, and he's now he's you know on YouTube or wherever shooting that thing, and people give him a hard time for that too. And there's like, like there's what is always it? What be is it? Looking. I know, but it's like, you know, it's, it, yeah. And the other thing is, is it, it's it, whether it's whether it it's, might be just people behind yeah. the keyboard, like, all right, fine, what have you guys done? Like he said, it's not easy. You know, it, it's definitely not easy. And he, yeah, he did. You are gonna. It, it, it's common. It just makes common sense. Like. A, a, a compound bow is probably going to wound more than a rifle. I'm, you know, a rifle probably has a better chance. A muzzleloader is probably going to wound more than a rifle. And then a muzzleloader might be a little better than a bow, and a compound bow. And then a compound bow is probably going to wound a little bit less than a, than a recurve. Like, it's the whole thing. It's like traditional. It's traditional because none of that stuff existed back then, and that's what they use. And that's, But technology is advanced. I'm not, you know, personally, I'm not the per- I, I want the technical advantage over the animal period i'm not the guy i probably never i i grew up with a recurve but then when i got my first browning i think it was a browning compound bow i don't even think they make boat compound bows anymore as heavy as a tank it was heavier than i was probably and it was loud it sounded like fourth of july going off when i'd let that it clack so loud that that you know an elephant would jump the string you know <laughs> it, 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 i probably wouldn't even be able to hit one and uh but you know i just progressively went and then just kind of work my way up to, you know, shooting a rifle. And if I can, you know, I'll shoot a Magnum, I'll shoot a 338 Lapua at a deer if I have to, if it gives me that advantage. And that's just me. That You know, other people want to use a, a smaller caliber and they say, you know, it's all about where you put it. And like, yeah, I want to put it there, but I want to make sure I don't have to chase this animal up and down the ridge. And that's just, you know, that's my my choice. And I think it's great if somebody wants to sneak up, a South Cox wants to, you know, sneak up on a on a mule deer up on a cliff and take all his clothes off because he's hot and he's waiting for this thing to stand up and he's throwing rocks at it, trying to get it to go. I think that's the best story ever. It's like finally stands up and he finally gets this deer with a recurve. It's like that, that's cool too. Like I, I, I couldn't, if, if he had two stories where the guy that like shot across the ridge, 600 yards versus the guy that snuck up six yards and, and had to go through all that, like I couldn't pick which one's cooler. I think they're, I mean, hunting's hunting, and the fact that the people are just out doing it is is the best part. Well, and that's, so. I mean, that's the great thing about the community is it's is it really is, especially at this point, like you said, the, the a lot of those walls are broken down. You know, everybody's going to give each other crap for, for something. Yeah. Good-natured, oh, not always good-natured, but... For sure. It's You still have that community. You still have that group of people, and... um you know, you can find, find those people, you can find those mentors. And I mean, honestly, that's what you've done a lot of for me recently. Mm -hmm. You've really opened my eyes to new things. You know, we just kind of started talking because, you know, you saw, I had a camo laptop cover and you commented. That's what started. Yeah, exactly. And it was real tree. It wasn't fusion or anything, but I didn't give you a hard time for it. Yeah, I know. What can I, what can I say? I'm I'm new at this. I still, I still do enjoy my real tree. Got it. Got it. But, uh, you know, we, we connected over that. We started talking and, and you've honestly, (laughs) as cheesy as sound, opened my eyes to this whole new, uh, experience of hunting that Mm. I thought was incredibly beyond my reach. And, uh, I really just want to say thank you mm-hmm. so much for that. And thank you for always being willing, you know, uh, y'all don't really know Samson that well, but, uh, he's probably the busiest guy in our office. <laughs> and, uh, every time I show up with a dumb question about whether or not I should get the 
3200 or the 7500 cubic inch pack mm-hmm. um you know i ended up buying both yes uh, well no that, and, <laughs> and that's the thing is like uh you know w- once you get into it that's always the option like you can't decide buy both mm-hmm. like and yeah. that's the other thing is there's tons of hunters out there that'll buy you know used gear so what's the big deal like you 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 scoop up both you see which one you like you sell the other one on rock slide that's all it is but just once again, thank you so much for always being willing to sit down, answer my questions, even just sit and tell me stories about hunting. Mm-hmm. I it it inspires me. It gets me super excited. Um, and also, thank you so much for for sitting down and talking with me about this. No, no um, problem. A lot of awesome stories. A lot of good advice. Yeah, uh, I feel like we could do this all night. I mean. Oh yeah, I, yeah. I'm I'm, I'm kind of looking at the time. I'm like, I might have to split Two parts this into a couple yeah. episodes. So, yeah. But uh, I I uh, I, I uh, I'm pretty passionate about you know certain things that I do, and hunting's definitely one of them. It's uh you know down to you know where I want to retire. You know when I do stop doing this crazy you know madness that we do. But you know it's uh when I look at you know retirement places, I always like oh you know what's the what's the bull to cow ratio in that town, you know, kind of, kind of thing. So <laughs> can they that's, add that filter on Zillow? Can they like, you know what it would, uh, if, if we could mix, uh, the go hunt insider and Zillow together, so you could pick like what units you wanted, but also like what the house price is in that unit. So you could move there. Uh, I'd totally buy that subscription. I wouldn't even care. I would be, I would be totally in. Just so. take my money now. Yeah, exactly. Like I, you know, I just give them a credit card number here, charge whatever you want on that. Like, cause, uh, until I buy a house and I have to, you know, pull off the Zillow part, but, um, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm, I don't do anything halfway. That's just in my nature. And it's one of those things. It's a blessing and a curse kind of thing. Um, like you said, you know, I do work a lot, but, um, it's just one of those things that, you know, I don't do anything that I'm not passionate about. Like I don't work, you know, I've never worked for anybody or doing anything that I didn't like. And if it ever got to that point, I'd just stop. Hunting's the same way. Fishing's, you know, pretty much the same way. Like, um, you know, the, the outdoors, if I had it my, you know, if somebody said, like, you, you can, uh, you know, keep doing what you're doing now or you can, you know, hunt for the rest of your life and take a 75% pay cut but you still be able to live, yeah, I probably, that would be um, a, a fairly easy decision. So, you know, I'm, the 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 dollar is not one of those things where I'm just like, you know, I'm not trying to be a millionaire. Like, you know, I'm not, I just want to, if I had it, be my, able to if, afford if, tags. Yeah. I just want to be able to, <laughs> I just want to be able to afford tags. Um, and I want to be the luckiest man ever when it comes to any of the draws. So, um, but the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just passionate about it. And that's the whole thing is I, I think that ha- more than half of the passion comes from sharing. Like, you know, I researched enough to where the wife goes absolutely crazy. Like, you know, it's two in the morning and I'm still on the computer and I'm, I got three screens up and I got, you know, I got Google earth up and I have, you know, go hunt and I have, you know, some, whatever state it is, I got their, you know, all their, all their stuff up and I'm reading through and looking at stuff and it's, whether it's, uh, the draws coming up and those are the worst nights because like, um, I don't really wait till the last minute, but I do wait till the last, you know, kind of week. And I'm just like, just printing out stuff and black lining and looking at this and graphs and doing my own graphs in Excel. And I'm looking at statistics and I'm looking at that. Like, do I want to shoot for the fence on the first choice and the second choice? Do I want to look at that? Like, is, do I want it to be a cow tag or whatever it is? So I'm just like, there's some units where I'm like, well, I'm not super like New Mexico. There's no, you know, there is no point system. So I'm like shooting for the fence and thinking like, all right, if I get it, cool. Cause that's amazing. But if I'm not, no big deal, move on to the next one, you know, but then there's other units where like, I definitely want to hunt this year and that's what it is. But I just get all passionate about it. It's the same thing when anybody comes up like, Hey, you hunt, you know, we've had other, there's other people in our office that have come up like talking about, you know, what's this, you know, whole thing about, you know, yeah, I'm I'm kind of interested in that. I I've had people just out of the blue where I'm just like, wow, I'd never thought in a million years that, you know, uh, that they would even want to know about hunting. I mean, 
one person in our office, uh, I've shared an office with before we moved to this office for almost a year, and he's a diehard vegan, and we sat across from each other. And I think that uh, I pretty much got him to the point where he's definitely not going to switch to meat anytime soon. And uh, But he accepts the fact that I hunt, and that's a, that's a win. You know, that's one of those things where he he he, he, he is – about as vegan as it can be as far as the um i call it vegan for the wrong reason like the people that are vegan because it's cool you know that whole la thing that we always run into and i'm sure it's in other places but um he like cool you're a hunter you work you know you wear camo to an office where people wear suits and so be it i'm in a position where i can you know um and uh you know it's just i want to try a vest on i bring a puffy vest in and it just happens to be a sika vest or a kuyu vest or whatever it is and uh you know everybody's fine with it yeah i get teased every now and then like meeting the other day somebody asked me if i just got back from hunting you know yeah and your yeah. response is i really wish i had no no my response was i never stopped <laughs> <laughs> you know i was just like well i haven't really stopped hunting i'm always hunting but um you know i i just have that that that's just that's just my that's just me and i'm um, anytime somebody has, has come, comes up with it and I don't, I don't force it down anybody's throat. That's the whole, that's the other part is like, Hey, you should be a hunter. Hey, you should hunt. But when somebody's interested in like, Hmm, what's this all about? Like I'm first one to jump in. Like, what do you want to know? You know? Yep. And then, uh, they might only want to know a little bit or they might want to like, all right, what, what, you know, I've living in LA I've, and even in Orange County getting the, all right, what's this whole hunting thing about? Like, like it's a new thing. It's. You know, what's, it's like a new craze. Like people, I mean, there's people here that have never left the city. I, I, I guarantee that the only time they've left the city is driving to Vegas. And they think that all the cities between here and here, here in Vegas are just desert kind of communities, which is funny. But, uh, the, you know, I get that. They're like, all right, what's this thing about? You know, what's, what's this whole hunt thing? And, you know, I break, break it down and explain it to them. I've not once had somebody like, well, that's dumb. You know, everybody's like, hmm, that's kind of cool. Because, you know, you explain it to them, like, you know, you you go through all this process. And it, 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 it's a, it is a process to to take an animal and, and to go and process, you know, and, and break it down and bring it back and, you know, use that for your food. From field and, and to it's, freezer. Yeah, exactly. And it's like one of those things. It's like, yeah, you can go buy a cow. You know, there's a lot of people that do that. And some guys that don't fill a tag, like, have to bite the bullet and go buy a cow. Like, that's what they do. They split a side of beef with their buddy or whatever it is. I've seen it. Never, uh, I've, I've never done that, but I've, I've seen it. And I get it. And they're just like, you know, it, it, there's a cost there. But um, we're not doing this because it's cheaper. Because if you divided all your gear your hunt your tags your fuel everything else like this elk is 44 dollars a pound i mean yeah. it, it, it's one of those Maybe things you or never whatever it is upgraded your gear over the course of well i years mean and- if you can which is pretty easy because you don't have to be that guy that buys new gear every year like oh, yeah. i'm the i'm the guy that buys your gear at the end of the year when it's cheaper like I, i'm just like i don't need the new i mean you go to the show and like you know first light came out with their new camo pattern and i was just like Ooh, that's nice but in my the back of my head i'm like i'm gonna get that on sale at the end of the season you know one of those things like you don't that that's the part that it's within and yeah i've i've bought i've bought full retail you know i i think the kuyu vest i just bought i paid pretty i mean i got a, a show discount but you know who pays over 200 bucks for a, a puffy vest but it's badass <laughs> and and whether it looks i don't care how it looks but it's comfortable and if i love it and i'd wear it every day and it's just so comfortable and like i'm not one of those people that have to wear head and toe of one particular camo or even brand like i'll wear a, a kuyu vest with a sitka jacket and you know first light pants i, I don't care like i probably you know if like it breaks up I, your i've never it i've never yeah, exactly it's like yeah you know, if the elk is sitting there laughing at him, that means I'm close enough to shoot him. Like, so be it. So, um, but you know, that, that's just, that's, that's just me. I'm, you know, that's how I do it. Well, Samson, I think we're going to end it there. Thank you once again so much for taking the time, sharing your passion with, with me and Mm -hmm. with all five people that are listening to my podcast. (laughs) Um, thank you, mom. Maybe Uh, six. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate you I'll and send us to six people, so we, we'll break that record. There we go. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Uh, but yeah, thanks again. No, no problem. 
All right, y'all. Well, that will do it for episode two of Living Country in the City. Thank you so much for joining me. Make sure you uh, check out the show notes page at livingcountryinthecity.com slash two. Uh, you can also check out all the different spots where you can subscribe to the podcast there. Just a reminder, I will be at the International Sportsman's Expo next week. So if you're going to be there, drop me a line. Hopefully we'll get to talk. Have a good one. Stay country, y'all. Thank y'all for listening to Living Country in the City. Get show notes and check out the blog, product reviews, events, and more at livingcountryinthecity.com.